So what's cool about having a small amount of people like this is you can have a discussion. <laughs> you can make it more interactive. So I might want to do that. I have questions that I can ask you guys, and since John kind of set the intention literally with care, um, I want to. I'm curious. What do you guys care about? What do you want to hear about? Because I don't want to just go on and ramble. And I do have action steps that I really want to focus on. But I want to hear from you guys. What would you have to say? What do you care about? And what do you want to hear about? Okay. So community. Cool. I agree. So clean eating. Community. And I have a paper where I can talk about a bunch of different things, which I find to be the root cause to, well, health and everything, to be honest. Because everything is health. I mean, health means whole in Latin. I actually started with health. Uh, that's what got me in this whole journey. I was an integrative nutrition health coach. I learned nutrition. Uh, when I was like 13, I was researching things. I was using the internet to my advantage. And then I took a nutrition course, 14, and then 2018. Uh, I'm I was born in 2000, so I'm not, you know, I'm not that experienced. I meet a lot of people who are way more experienced than me, right? So the permaculture community, I got involved with directly in Florida. Uh, for instance, he mentions Jim Gale. He has 50 acres, 50 acres in central Florida, about Orlando. Okay, so Orlando area, and in Orlando, you know, he's got grazing animals. He's got off-grid Airbnbs, and you can walk through his food forest. And even in just one acre of food forests, that's an abundance of food. Because what's cool is you have more food concentrated in one small area. So I know he's going to go deep into that. And since that's not technically health, <laughs> it is. I would say it's probably most important. You're growing your own food. I'll go into other aspects of health that I find really important because he'll cover the food forest. Um, so when I got into nutrition, I didn't expect, but I mean, it's you could expect it, that when you get into natural medicine or doing anything with nutrition, it's not patented. It's not something that you can make a huge amount of profit on. Um, for instance, people are not covered by insurance. And the doctors that I would meet, uh, they were restricted as to what they can do, what they can't do. And you see many doctors were leaving, actually, when COVID happened because they weren't able to freely go about their own practice. Okay, and some people even had their license revoked or even challenged, even recently Jordan Peterson, who's a popular psychologist, you might have heard of him, gets millions of views online, he starts speaking up about things, his license might be taken away. A license though? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> See, there's a bigger issue than health, unfortunately, and which is why I ran into it, which is why I shifted my priorities. It's called freedom. <laughs> And so one of the focuses about Jim Gale, the permaculture community, and what's happening with growing food is a lot of those people care about freedom, not just health. And people are realizing those two need to go together. There needs to be. If you don't have the freedom to grow food, then you can't grow food. <laughs> and growing food allows you to be free by default because you're self-sufficient. You have the tools needed to take control of your land, your life, your health, everything. <laughs> like really, Food allows you to barter with others. It's a system of economy. It's everything. Um, so that's why Jim Gale's like, this is the solution, right? And there's many people who are going to say, this is the solution. But honestly, who can disagree with growing food? You know, there's a lot of people who talk about all sorts of things nowadays online and all over the place, and you get kind of confused, ideologies and different ways to think, but nobody I really ran into says, no, we should not grow food. <laughs> we're like, yeah, we, we don't want people starving or anything. So if we were, for instance, this was their idea, just replace grass or ornamental plants with edibles, there goes cancer, most diseases, uh, hunger, right? So there you go. I mean, if I think <laughs> some big step for health would simply be that. And why weren't we taught these permaculture principles that have been taught for thousands of years since like, ancient times? Jonathan's using copper wires in his garden to bring in energy from the earth. How many people know about that? Okay, so I want to get into freedom a little bit more because unfortunately most people who talk about it go into politics <laughs> and that's not having to do with growing food. Certainly I don't see any politician talking about growing food. I don't see them talking about morality or psychology. And that's unfortunate because even Jonathan who just spoke about care talked about how that's important in regards for freedom. I just talked about growing food. How come none of the politicians are mentioning growing food? Well, it's simply because it doesn't have to do with politics. It makes you free of that system. You don't need these politicians when you have these resources that make you truly free, you may say. So, I mean, if I were to ask you guys, like, who wants a smaller government? I'm sure it'd be pretty much everybody I talk to. I don't see people like, oh, I want a bigger government. 
And if I ask, oh, do you need different laws or different politicians? Everybody would probably agree. And if I ask them, why did you vote? They'll probably say it's because they're the lesser of the other guy. You know, I vote for this guy because I didn't like the other one. <laughs> These are just some funny things, and, and if you look at the psychology of it, you're like, what is going on here? Is anybody really, you know, like what's going on? And how long has this been happening? For thousands of years? Is there a better system that we need to, like, move into? And a lot of people have their grand theories and ideas, and I'm here to tell you I don't have that idea. But how many people are willing to go on stage, or a politician, and say they don't have the answers? Is there, is there a time where we say, well, we're not supposed to have control over our fellow human beings or impose our will, tell them how to live their own lives and, you know, pass laws that impose violence upon certain groups of people because that's what laws do. Otherwise, it's a recommendation. It's just a, a general guideline <laughs> and people can voluntarily follow it. But are laws voluntary? Are these systems voluntary? And these are the questions. I would agree, I would ask most people, do you want division? And people would say, no, I don't want division, right? Do you want love? Do you want, do you care about humankind? They said, we care. Well, how much do we really apply that? Do you agree with the golden rule? Do unto others what you want done unto you. Well, if that's the case, you don't want violence being done unto you because you disagree with certain things, right? Well, what makes it right for your worldview to be imposed on everybody else? Think about it. So these are just some things that we break on a day-to-day -day basis, and I'm saying most people do by supporting these systems, regardless of who they pass and regardless of what laws they pass. Simple psychology, which if you look at like the Stanley Milgram experiment, this is a banned psychology experiment. What they did was they had people, um, everyday people, right? They had a scientist who was an authority figure, a person who looked with an authority figure, Okay, and ask, they would ask the person, hey, uh, they would have, them, so this is how it would be, okay? So it would be three people. There would be the person who's asking the questions. <laughs> Can't have this. I don't want to do this paper. Here, can you hold it? I don't need it right now. So they'd have the person who's asking the questions to this person behind the screen. This person is a staged actor, okay? And this person is like to scream in pain if they get the question wrong because the person asking the questions has to zap them every time they get a question wrong. And they zap them because the authority figure says, oh, don't worry, it's, it's, it's not painful, and this is just part of the experiment. You have to go along with it. And the, and the everyday person would zap their fellow human being to the highest voltage because they were told to do so. And they would simply say, oh, it's because I'm following orders. And I'm simply following orders. It's not my responsibility. I'm just doing it because the scientist told me. Because this is an experiment. That's why I'm doing it. And so they were willing to suppress their conscience because they thought... Oh, it's right because I'm just doing what I'm told. This is the real reason why we're not free, and this is the reason why Nazi Germany happened, Soviet Russia, all these countries in World War II, all wars whatsoever, is because there were order followers who turned off their brain, their morality, and suppressed it because of politicians that they see as authority figures. And people doing the medical industry too, doctors doing what they're told, thinking, yeah, I got to do it because I was told to do it. <laughs> my license says I got to do it. If I don't do it, I'll get my license revoked. That license is paid for, bought by the government, which again, backed by violence. So you have this system of perpetual violence where people are being imposed upon and everybody's okay with it because they think it's just how it has to be, right? And people have an obligation. They feel to stay in it. They don't know how to get out of it. And everybody says, well, I'm just doing it because I was told to do it, so they don't take responsibility for their own actions. If they kill someone, they say, well, I was told to do it even though I was the one who did it. <laughs> so think about how, how hypocritical that is. There's a concept called mental slavery. And if you go back to the abolitionist, I write books about this, uh, slavery. Not any historian will talk about slavery the way I do because I look at the actual abolitionist who went and ended at the time. And I had to go to the back of some libraries to find their material. The way that they ended slavery after thousands of years, chattel slavery, thousands of years of people just accepting this open practice that was very much dreadful, the way they ended it was through moral suasion, is what they called it, which is affecting the conscience or the morality of everyday people. Saying, well, you just said, under the Declaration of Independence, we're all created equal, but yet you have slaves. <laughs> Some of the abolitionists went on the streets and they publicly burned the Constitution 
like William Lloyd Garrison, one of the number one abolitionists, said it was a covenant of death in agreement with hell. How many people would be willing to do that? There were Christians, very religious people, these uh, abolitionists. And they went against the churches because the churches were supporting slavery. They're like, you choose, to, you want to be Christians, you don't even have follow your own golden rule because you hold slaves. <laughs> and you don't want to be enslaved, but you want to enslave these other people. It was just right in front of their faces, but yet everybody was okay with it. And they, were, they were even putting target, like hit lists of these abolitionists and burning their house. A lot of them went to jail. They had to be bailed out. It was a crazy time. And they were being censored. And a lot of that is actually happening now with content creators who are speaking out. They're getting censored and being platformed, so you can't find them if you're going on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or whatever. Whatever's a mainstream platform. If you don't know about BitChute, Brighteon, Odyssey, Library, these are platforms that are blowing up. Rumble because people are not, you know, they're they're just fed up with what's going on, the censorship and and. It's not about First Amendment, freedom of speech. It's freedom of speech because you're a human being. You have the ability to speak. It's interesting how we twist our ideas and think they need to be put onto a political language. But see, slavery, this is the ownership of another human being. They would call it something else. Like for instance, oh, the freedom of a slave is not freedom, it's enfranchisement. It's, it's manumission. They had words for this. And it made it sound somewhat different. Just like when we say taxation. It's still theft. That's all it is. And I'm willing to say it because it's the same action. Somebody taking money that belongs to you. That's your property. So, again, does this not affect our health? The fact that innocent people are being stolen from on a day-to-day -day basis. And that people who are basically just minding their own business, living their own life, are being affected by others simply because they're told to do so. <laughs> Even though they wouldn't do it themselves. With their own conscience. So it seems to me like that lack of responsibility then pours into other aspects of life and you have this ripple effect, what Carl Jung called the shadow, that is then cast upon society. Our insecurities, a lot of our traumas are being projected. And you look at cops and you look at that field of enforcement and look at how they can't maintain their marriage and they have a lot of these psychological problems. And you look at veterans that come back from war and they talk about their traumas and how they had to kill people. And they're like, oh, man, I really wish I didn't do it, but I had no choice because I was following orders and I thought I was doing right. I interviewed many uh, cops and veterans who were part of that system. And if you talk to a lot of them, you know, this is what they tell you. But what does our society do? Let's celebrate them. <laughs> Let's make a Veterans Day. Let's give them some extra benefits so they can so sort of push out that trauma and we can celebrate the fact that people are suppressing their conscience. And so this is the society we've built. Again, a perpetual violence system. And that's why I chose to look at it. It's not really looked at, but yet I, look, I mentioned that psychology experiment, which is banned. There's also the Stanford Prison Experiment, where they gave everyday people these, this role of an authority figure in the jail system, and they had to end the experiment in a week. <laughs> it's very famous because they quickly abused their power. They believed that they were an authority figure. They very quickly, even though they were good people going in, they become corrupted very quickly because they were pressured into that scenario. Well, think about becoming a president. If I ask most of you and I say, do you want to be a ruler? Do you want to be a president? I could probably ask you guys questions on what do you think should be done about this? What do you think should be done about this? And you guys would have great ideas, better ideas than all these politicians. But would, you, would I say, if I ask you, would you want to impose that on me with violence? You'd say no. So why isn't it voluntary? Is my question to you. Why don't we live in a voluntary world, just as we do for everything else in the world? We voluntarily pick what products we want to buy, what we want to choose. We go into relationships voluntarily. We aren't being coerced, and we call that an abusive relationship. We call an abuse of drugs, right? But a proper use of alcohol would just become abusive. <laughs> So we have this like abusive relationship with government. We have this addiction to having it in our lives. And yet we don't ex see the fact that it's involuntary by its nature, that it's abusive by its nature. And that, you know, we have rules in society that is for property, that is for our own property, that is for, you know, our families, our, as the schools, the organizations. These are voluntary. They're not backed by violence. And it's doing great for society. 
And corporations too. Yes, we can say they have problems. You can look at Amazon, you can look at Google, but they're not paying taxes. <laughs> they're getting benefits through the government. They're working with them. That's what makes it dangerous. They can just get somebody in there, lobby them, give them money, and they can do anything they want. So when you have a system that gives corporations the ability to commit violence upon other people so they can grow their business and take out all their competition, that's not a free market. But yet, a lot of people will think we live in a capitalist society, a free market society. No, we don't. A truly free market society would be voluntary, where there are tons of different products and solutions for everything. You want a security solution? There isn't just one centralized you know, police force <laughs> that you can go to that are minutes away when things happen in seconds. You know, who are going to be the ones who are order followers are going to bring you to the FEMA camps or whatever they're setting up, just as they did with the Japanese internment camps in the United States when the American public was not being told about it. And that only happened not even a hundred years ago. Just as, you know, all this other stuff happened not even a hundred years ago. And look at all the people cheering up Hitler and cheering up Stalin, looking up to them like heroes and gods and crying. Look at the crowds and how much propaganda was used to help those people think they're patriotic and good. They had constitutions. That these constitutions said you have the freedom of speech. You have the right to vote. They were constitutional republics. And yet, how many people now talk about how America is a constitutional republic? We have freedoms. We're the greatest country on earth. They have flags and they worship. They were taught in school through the Prussian schooling model system to do a pledge to that flag. So they think they're free. Are they really? Mental slavery is the idea that you think that it's right to be a slave. That's what mental slavery is. And it's the root to all slavery. It's the root to, and it always leads to physical slavery. Martin Luther King said that. Mahatma Gandhi said that. Many of the famous you know, people throughout history have said that. People who did not seek positions of authority, but people who were very influential, educating, and influencing others in simply sharing their worldview, saying, here is a better world. And that's what the abolitionists did. A lot of them actually said, do not vote, because it contributes to that system of slavery. The, the government was actively against the abolitionists. They passed a law that said, well, <laughs> if a slave runs away, they have to bring them back to the plantation. So that's how bad it was. The abolitionists were like, wow, the government just waged war on us. Like They literally made a hit list not just on them, but also the slaves that run away, and they have to bring them back. And so every citizen is considered a criminal if they, do not, if they find a runaway slave, and they do not report it or bring it back to the plantation. <laughs> now, slavery is not just an American institution. It went back even further. It goes back to Samaria about 6,000 years ago. And Samaria was the first form of government, because you cannot have a systemic form of slavery without a system in place. And if you ask yourself, how do you create these governments? How do new governments rise? It's always a war. <laughs> it's always a war, whether it's a civil war or a war of one kind or another, one group of people coming in and taking over another group of people again. It all rests on that belief of authority. When the slave realizes they're not meant to be a slave and that their master does not control them because that master has no right, guess what? There's no slavery. And so the same exact scenario with the governments. When people realize that their masters, their governments, are no longer supposed to have that authority, and that they own themselves, then it goes away. It's, it's, lit it's literally just a superstition, a belief system that's holding humanity back. Just as much as we believe that witches existed and we need to burn them and put them on the cross or whatever crazy barbaric practices we back, did back then that we believed in. A lot of this stems back to religion. Because religions, a lot of people say they kind of hold us back. They can also bring us together. They can do good. The abolitionists were religious people. It depends on how you apply it. Some were saying you can use the Bible for slavery. Others were saying it was anti-slavery. The point is... <laughs> If you go back to the first foundation of government, they believe they had the divine right to rule over you. I have the right to rule over you. God gave it to me. And therefore, you have no choice. You are meant to be this. And if you want to be free, you have to work for it. Work for your freedom and then we'll grant it to you. Is that freedom? If you have to be granted or a freedom, is that really? Right? Does, does freedom require permission? Do you require permission to be free? 
If you pass a law, that's my freedom. Is freedom really a natural principle? Can you say you have natural rights if your rights have to be granted to you? So we say we have natural rights. We say we want equality. We say we want freedom. We say we care, but do we really? These are just questions for you. Because you see, I can't do the thinking for you. I can only help you see the reality that you live in, which is literally so obvious, it's right in front of your face once you understand it. We're all just people. These people who put on badges and uniforms or put on the crown, they're no different just because they do that. Oh, I was born in this bloodline, and that's why I'm here. Uh, like the king and queen structure, monarchy, right? I was here in this bloodline, so I must be in this position. The Pope, I was in this position. This is who I am. People are not falling for anymore, which is why you have New Age religion and atheism and these other forms coming in, because people are realizing with the advent of science, it's like, this doesn't make any sense. And people knew this thousands of years ago. The ancient Chinese philosophy, I wrote a book about it, my recent one, Taoism, uh, from ancient China, about 2,500 years ago, before the Bible, there was a guy in China who recognized, look how everything in nature kind of happens on its own. The birds sing, they do their thing, things grow, if you put it in the ground it grows, like everything just, everything doesn't really disappear, everything just always is manifesting and working by itself, like your heart pumps by itself, your lungs pump by itself, you don't have to think about it, it happens autonomously. So they thought, well what if we can just work with that natural intelligence, what we were given by nature, and that is actually what creates order. And rather, in China, you had Confucius at the time, you might have heard Confucius. His ideas were the ones that got popular. He thought, well, humans are evil, so we need to create laws to make them good. But these Taoists were saying, wait, humans are not inherently good or evil. You know, they're programmable. They can change depending on how humans raise them. They're conditionable. But you know what? Humans can have order if you just let them be free. And the Confucians and those people in China did not understand that. They're like, well, you know, humans, they're going to do bad things, so therefore we need to impose laws on all of them. Right? So because of that one possible thief, we need to create a whole system that steals from everybody to prevent a possible one form of theft. So let's guarantee theft to prevent possible theft. You starting to see the hypocrisy here? I hope so. It can be kind of hard to understand. It took me quite a bit of time. It takes a lot of people. Again, it's a superstition we're raised into. The Prussian schooling system teaches us from a very young age, obey authority, obey you know, your teacher and these different systems. Now it's okay to have a, a teacher. It's okay to have these different guys. I respect my family. I was raised in a very traditional family, very you know, close with my parents and I respect them. I obey them because I want to be in that relationship and they're loving to me. But look how the relationships have up if they're abusive to me, if they're mean, in a, in a sense of they want to physically do violence to me. Those relationships don't do well. Well, the same thing as the government systems that be. But see, they don't claim to have an authority over my life. They recognize my self-ownership. They recognize I can leave if I want to. I have the ability to voluntarily choose how to live my own life. Self-ownership destroys all the political systems that be. It doesn't matter what system you have. So you can call me an anarchist, which means no rulers. It doesn't mean no rules. And anarchon in Greek, just as monarchon means one ruler. But I don't use that word because it's not obviously a word that has been used in that context. It's been used to mean chaos, even though the abolitionists were the first anarchists. I mean, that should be telling. Which historian will tell you that? Aidan Ballou, Josiah Warren set up towns for the Underground Railroad to help the slaves escape. So those systems were tax-free. A lot of them had their own monetary systems. They were helping slaves run away from the plantation. So they were literally accepting to be criminals because they knew it was right to do. Our founding fathers, we look at them as heroes. They were cop killers, killing all the, the, the British that were taking over their towns. We don't look at them like that. We don't say it like that. But that's what they honestly are. Just as a politician isn't going to go on stage and say, I'm going to do this, and they're going to tell you all the good things, leave out all the bad things, and they're not going to say, I'm going to do it with violence. They're going to say, we're just going to do it. They don't tell you how. And that how is the most dangerous because we are responsible for our own actions, right? We're responsible for what we put out in the world, and we don't realize that we're quite literally creating violence when we support these systems. So... 
that's what I, I really want to leave you guys on that note of mental slavery. Think about it. I want you to think about it. Here's my paper. I want to see, because I have some quotes here from an abolitionist. Here's uh, Frederick Douglass. You might have learned about him at school, right? To make a contented slave, you must make a thoughtless one. It is necessary to darken his moral and mental vision, and as far as possible to inhaliate his power of reason. He must be able to detect no inconsistencies in slavery. The man that takes his earnings must be able to convince him that he has a perfect right to do so. It must not depend upon mere force. The slave must know no higher law than his master's will. The whole relationship must not only demonstrate to his mind its necessity, but its absolute righteousness. It is the nature of slavery to beget a state of all things around it favorable to its own condition. And so everything in our society is built to support the system. So you don't see what I just told you guys. That it is a system based in slavery. It's always been. It's always built on war and capture and jail, which is why chattel slavery still exists in our jailing system. But chattel slavery is just one form of slavery. The greatest form of slavery, as the abolitionists called it, is political slavery. Because that is the form that creates all of them. I can give you quotes and quotes for days and from founding fathers and people from the 1800s that the conservatives and the liberals, none of them will tell you about. Libertarians too, they're just in that game as well. Martin Luther King Jr., as long as the mind is enslaved, the body can never be free. Psychological freedom and a firm sense of self-esteem is the most powerful weapon against the long night of physical slavery. Bob Marley said the same thing. He was killed by the CIA. The guy said it on his deathbed. Etienne de la Boetze is a French writer from the 1500s. He says, all men, as long as they remain men, before letting them themselves become enslaved, they must either be driven by force or led into it by deception. Conquered by foreign armies, as were Sparta and Athens, by the forces of Alexander, or by political factions, as when at an earlier period the control of Athens had passed into the hands of another guy. When they lose their liberty through deceit, they are not so often betrayed by others as misled by themselves. So we have to take responsibility. We want to point the finger and say, these people changed the world. What about us? The abolitionists took it in their own hands. Our founding fathers took it in their own hands. Right? And a lot of them didn't want a war. To end chattel slavery, that's, the war didn't end it. Writing down the piece of paper does not make slavery wrong just because you wrote it down. It's because they changed the hearts and minds of people. That's what ended it. Okay? The government used that to say, oh, look, look, we're victors. We've ended slavery. We're so nice. We care about you. You wanted the end of slavery, so we wrote it down on a piece of paper. Our authority made it look legitimate, and therefore it's a gun. But guess what happened after the Civil War? They introduced taxation, they introduced a bunch of problems, and, and slavery was still a problem, and the abolitionists talked about it. So yeah, I have a bunch more quotes and everything like that, but that's it. Remember that the difference between a gang and a government is the gang can do something wrong, they can hold hostages, they can control lands, they can claim control over different property, but they do not claim to have an authority over your own life. They can steal something from you, and they can claim to even have authority from you, but nobody will go along with it because they recognize them as a gang, that what their actions are doing is wrong. But when it comes to government or law and, and police, people look at them as moral and right for doing bad and moral things because they are the police. They are the law. Now you may say there's good and bad police. Well, then they're just a human being protecting another human being if they're doing a good action. I look at the action. I don't look at people, say there's a good person, there's good actions, and people, I look at all us as equals. <laughs> I don't say there's an inherently good person, inherent authority in people. I don't do that. I think that's nonsense, right? So that's the thing. Mental slavery leads to physical, internal to external, and the covert becomes overt. That's just manifestation and how it works. And so if stealing 100% of somebody's labor, the products of their labor is slavery, at what percentage is it not slavery? Zero percent, right? One percent of theft is still theft, is it not? Do you own the chair or do you not own the chair? Yes or no? Do you own yourself? Do you not own yourself? Yes or no? Oh, I own like 50% of your stuff. What? How does that work? I would like to know. 
Yeah, so there you go. <laughs> Dr. Carl Jung even said in his last book, The Undiscovered Self, that limited government doesn't work. It always leads to what he calls autocracy and oligarchy. Uh, that religion, government acts as a religion so it can control you um, and make you obey its authority because if you, he noticed that religious towns and religious states were actually freer than those who weren't because they saw an authority higher than man. And uh, he also talked about psychic epidemics. Mental slavery, mass psychosis, mass hysteria, very similar. The idea that worse than tornadoes, worse than any catastrophe in this world is a belief system that's a lie. So that's coming from the world's, one of the most famous psychologists saying, limited government doesn't work, all the forms don't work, and it just keeps happening over and over again. So the real government of this world is the free market. Again, supply and demand, very basic. If people want something, it'll happen. And if, and if it's, <laughs> I'll ask you a question. Without government, who will provide blank? Okay, so first question, is it important? If it's not important, then it's a waste of money. <laughs> and it's also your opinion, right? So remember that. If you say it is important, then would you pay if you weren't forced to? And if you say no, then it's not important. <laughs> and if you say yes, then it's voluntary because you're willing to pay for it. So that is already defeating the point of the question. Just think about it. And if you get, if you're confused, you can come up to me. I have a list of questions. And I guarantee you, you'll start thinking about it. Because again, nobody's going to ask you these questions. Taoism has a concept for this Wu Wei it means non action, let things be effortless living. Wouldn't it be great to live more effortlessly? If your health was so good, you would not talk about health. There'd be no need to talk about health. There wouldn't even need to be doctors because you're good health which is why they need your business, which is why they need you to be sick, because otherwise they have no business. So in the same way, if we're free, we don't need the government. <laughs> we live so autonomous, so as we're meant to be, that we actually don't need a lot of these systems that we created. Again, if you want to say it's a voluntary government, go right ahead, I have no problem with that. <laughs> you know, whatever term you use, all I'm saying is it's a system that is not backed by violence where somebody's seen and have a, a, little bit, a legitimate authority over a fellow human being. This to me is an inevitable evolution. It's just a matter of time for us to recognize it. And if our minds create the world and the masses give power to few, we recognize fewer control of the masses, then the change is in the minds of the masses. It cannot happen any other way. And this is why you have in philosophy the idea of know thyself. And philosophers for ages were thinking, what could we do to create a better system? They never sought positions of authority. It was always the politicians who took their ideas and brought it to positions of power. Because you can practice voluntary communism, voluntary socialism, voluntary capitalism. All these isms don't matter. There's always going to be ideologies and everybody's always going to disagree with each other. That's just called humanity. That's called uniqueness. That's called individuality. When you respect that, you respect division and uniqueness among other human beings, that's how you have unity. That's how you have peace on earth. So that's it. That's it. If you generally care about freedom and all that comes with it, accept my challenge. I have quizzes and AI that can even challenge you. And uh, the Socratic method is probably the best way to teach these ideas, as you may have seen, just asking questions. And over time, by showing by example, growing food forests and other methods as such, you can really show it in action, that autonomous type of natural living, which we are meant to have. Thank you very much for watching.